Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webcast called Knee Internal Contact Forces in the Knee Osteoriasis Population. Today's outline is first a brief introduction by me. I'm your host. My name is Kasper P. Larsmussen, and I work here at Anybody Technology as a Simulations Engineer. After the brief introduction, we're going to have today's main event done by our presenter, Andrea Delisola, who is a lecturer in biomechanics at Edinburgh Napier uh, University. Uh, today's work was done at Glasgow Caledonian University. Um, the webcast is going to be in in two sections. The first one is the clinical application of biomechanical models to estimate knee contact forces in patients with osteoarthritis. And the second one is the identification of clinical subgroups which may benefit from biomechanical intervention. And in the end, we're going to have our questions and answers session. And today I have the pleasure of sitting next to our panelist, Michael Skipper Anderson, who was a part of the project, and he will be ready to answer any technical aspects, questions um, about the project. The, uh, the Anybody Modeling System is a system for doing musculoskeletal simulations. The input is measured or described data in the form of kinematics, as in movements and force data. And then you run your musculoskeletal simulation to output body loads, which is joint and muscle forces. Now, the anybody modeling system has a wide range of applications, such as product design optimization. You can do ergonomic analysis. Uh, there is surgical planning and output uh, evalu outcome evaluation. And you can also output the data to use it in uh, load cases for finite element analysis. And then there's, of course, free movement analysis, such as gate in gate lab with the mocap. A typical workflow in anybody would uh, look something like this. You would first come with your own motion and forces. That could be in the form from a motion capture lab, or it could be some measured or prescribed uh, data in another way. Then you would use one of our existing body models, or you could, uh, of course, create your own. And then in the end, there is the possibility of using an environment and in our case here, we have a exoskeleton. Then you would combine all these things and you'll be able to run different kinds of analysis. And after that, you would output these internal body, body loads, such as muscle forces and joint forces. Um, Post-processing, you could, as I mentioned before, use the output for, for example, finite element tools and then there's of course the possibility of doing this iterative design loop where you change your environment and and run the simulation again to see the changes in results all right that was the introduction from me. I'm now going to hand the screen to our presenter, Andrea. Thank you uh, again for the introduction and thank you all uh, for taking part in this webcast that you see the use of a biomechanical model to estimate the internal contact forces in the knee uh, osteoarthritis population. I will start with a very brief uh, introduction about osteoarthritis that is the most common joint uh, disease and is actually one of the top five causes of disability worldwide. 
So it is estimated that roughly 20% of the uh, global population aged over 50 is affected by osteoarthritis. Therefore, it's a very prevalent disease. The knee is the most affected joints, but despite the high prevalence and the high burden of this disease, treatments uh, actually available are limited to pain management and they're not able to modify the disease course. This seems to be due to the high complexity and heterogeneity that characterize this disease. In fact, if we want to give a definition of osteoarthritis, it seems that it's not a single disease process, but rather um, uh, the outcome of a range of disorders initiated by different components like biological, morphological and structural components. So if you want to simplify and create a model of osteoarthritis, we can have, as you see on the right hand side of the slide, knees characterized by normal loading, but an altered physiology. This means that these knees pre present uh, something like inflammation or metabolic factors or even genetic factors that drive the disease. On the other side, we can instead have knees with a normal physiology, but an altered loading. In this case, there will be something like malalignment or muscle weakness or even a trauma that can explain uh, the disease or can cause the disease. So as you can already see from this slide, it seems that different pathway can be identified um, under the same disease, under osteoarthritis. And this is the reason because we talk about phenotypes. Phenotypes are a group of patients characterized by a specific group of characteristics that are indicative of a unique underlying mechanism, which can explain the outcome uh, of the disease, like pain or the physical function. So a phenotype is a specific group of patients in which it's possible to identify a specific disease mechanism. At Glasgow Caledonia University, we, have been, uh, we conducted a systematic review to try to identify which uh, phenotypes have been in explored and are supported by evidence. What emerged that six uh, main phenotypes have been frequently uh, investigated. Among these, uh, we can find subjects uh, with osteoarthritis and uh, inflammation, but also subjects with chronic pain or alteration in the bone and cartilage metabolism. But today I want to talk uh, specifically about a phenotype that seems characterized by a biomechanical overload, which is responsible for the disease. So this biomechanical phenotype seems to be characterized mainly by malalignment. As you probably know, uh, knee alignment is, one, is the main factor responsible for the load distribution between the medial and lateral compartment. It has been hypothesized that subject with a malalignment severe enough to drive the disease belong therefore to a biomechanical phenotype. Uh, Varus malalignment, that is the deformity that you see here uh, in this slide, is the most common uh, malalignment in subject with osteoarthritis. Therefore, it, is, uh, uh, it has been hypothesized that these patients with varus malalignment will have a higher uh, load on the medial compartment and develop the disease again in the medial compartment and belong to a specific phenotype. Therefore, to target this specific kind of patients, biomechanical interventions have been developed. Uh, in this slide, I just uh, listed some of the ones that are available, but the most common are in fact uh, lateral wedged insoles, knee bracing uh, or um, gait modifications. Here are just uh, two examples of how these interventions uh, work. Uh, valgus bracing uh, aim to produce a valgus moment on the knee that will contrast the normal uh, adduction moment, and this would reduce the load on the medial compartment. Lateral wedged insoles have the same objective of reducing the load on the medial compartment, but they do so shifting the ground reaction force laterally and therefore reducing, reducing the lever arm of this force. So despite the theory, it says that um, subjects with virus alignment should have a biomechanical disease, and despite having interventions that are supposed to uh, reduce the load on the medial compartment, when we investigate the effectiveness of these interventions, we see that the evidence are contrasting. Some patients seem to benefit from this intervention, while others benefit less. 
one of the reason can be that selecting the patients with based on virus alignment do not uh, does not guarantee to identify subjects with increased medial contact force so it's possible that maybe in these trials in the population there are also subjects that do not have an increased medial contact force and therefore we have this contrasting result in fact if we look uh, at what happened uh, in the knees of patients with virus malalignment we can see that some of them have also lateral compartment degeneration and as if, if you remember uh, the slide before when virus malalignment is present uh, the lateral compartment should be uh, un unloaded or better underload, underloaded compared to the medial compartment and this uh, hypothesis that not all the subjects with virus malalignment have an higher medial contact force seems to be supported by a recent study published by Kumar in 2013 uh, who failed to identify difference in the medial contact force between subjects with medial way and virus alignment and controls. As I said, one of the reasons can be that the way in which the patients are selected, using only virus alignment maybe is not sensitive enough, as well as using only X-ray maybe is not uh, sensitive enough to determine where the disease is located, so there is the risk to include also uh, subject that do not have an higher medial contact force. Therefore, uh, uh, it's really important to identify uh, these subjects uh, because identifying patients with an higher medial contact force could actually uh, lead us to uh, develop personalized treatments or any way to improve treatment, treatment allocation to do in a way that the treatments that uh, are already available, like the uh, lateral wedge insoles or knee bracing, may actually uh, see an increased effectiveness when tested in the right population. Therefore, our hypothesis is that selecting the patient just based on the alignment is not enough. Because if we will compare the three groups that is, you see in this slide, so a virus uh, alignment uh, group with osteoarthritis compared to subject with osteoarthritis but neutral alignment and controls, we will probably not find any difference in contact force as it already happened uh, in the study from Kumar. So our hypothesis is that if we divide the subjects with virus malalignment in patients with medial osteoarthritis and subjects with generalized osteoarthritis, so a disease that extends to the lateral compartment, we will probably be able to identify uh, a specific subgroup with increased medial contact force or medial loading. And in this case, will be the one with only medial disease. We therefore design a study to uh, try to identify the subgroup and so our primary objective was to compare the knee joint contact forces across the aforementioned groups. Our secondary objective uh, instead was to explore the relationship between alignment and medial contact force but especially was to explore how this relationship changes between the several groups. Statistically this means to uh, verify whether the subgroup uh, membership is actually a mediator of this uh, relationship. In addition, we wanted to also compare MRI biomarkers of joint damage across the groups. We wanted to do so because, of course, uh, we uh, wanted to see if differences in uh, um, internal knee loading may correspond also to differences in the damage of the joint because this will actually present a strong link to support the hypothesis that uh, um, medial contact forces or variation in the joint biomechanics may lead to joint damage. To uh, carry out the study, uh, we selected a sample of 39 neosteritis patients and 18 controls from a court that was already available at Glasgow Caledonia University. All these patients underwent uh, MRI, uh, gait analysis, and a clinical assessment. The MRI was used to identify the subject with only medial disease, um, opposite to the one that also have uh, a more generalized disease. This is because MRI is more sensitive uh, and seems to be a better measure than X-ray. Specifically, we used the block score. It is a semi-quantitative score. This means that the lesions in the cartilage were not assessed, uh, were not measured in microns, but were scored with two values. One, 
that represent the percentage of the area affected by cartilage loss and another value that instead express the extent of full thickness lesions in that area. A full thickness lesion is a lesion of the cartilage that uh, reach the bone starting from the surface. In the block score, each compartment is uh, divided in three areas, an anterior, a weight bearing, and a posterior area. For the study, we analyze only the weight bearing area of uh, medial and lateral compartment of both the fibia and the femur. Now we just wanted to do some uh, short examples to make clear how the block score uh, works. So a block score of one zero, for example, indicates an area in which the degeneration is less than 10% and there are no full thickness lesion as the zero indicates in this case. A block score instead of two zero represents uh, an area in which the degeneration cover 10 to 70% of the surface and there are no full thickness lesions. A block score of two one instead indicates uh, an area with the degeneration that covered 10 to 17 percent of the surface with the presence this time of full thickness lesions that however are less than 10 percent of the area so uh, we uh, divided the sample in several subgroups and to do so we use the alignment measured from uh, from the um, gate lab data using the IPNI angle. Various subjects were identified when their deformity was two degrees or more in a virus direction. Instead, neutral subjects were uh, subjects in which the knee alignment variation was of one degree or less in either direction. We used the block score to identify instead where the disease was located, either medially or in both compartments and as I just said we use the block score specifically a block score of two zero or higher in the medial compartment while there was a block score of one zero or lower in the lateral compartment was used as a cutoff to identify subjects with medial osteoarthritis so again a, a block score of two zero or higher this means that the degeneration was between 10 17 percent or more in the medial compartment, while was less than 10% in the lateral compartment without possibility of having full thickness lesion, so a very minimal disease in the lateral compartment. Generalized way instead were subjects in which um, in the lateral compartment the degeneration was more than 10% with the possibility of having full thickness lesion, or anyway when the degeneration in the lateral compartment was higher than in the medial compartment. So let's see uh, how the sample was divided. As I said, we had 18 controls. The neosteritis patients were then divided based on alignment in virus and neutral subjects. We obtain in this way 10 subjects with osteoarthritis and neutral alignment. Dividing further the subject with virus alignment, we identified 12 patients with virus and medial OA and 17 with virus and generalized way. We then uh, use a musculoskeletal model. We started uh, creating a, a stick figure that was derived based on the markers from the standing reference trial. We use the 20 lower extremity uh, model that was morphed uh, to match this stick figure. We then use the stick figure to estimate the kinematics uh, of the patients from the dynamic trial. Specifically, uh, we estimated the uh, knee internal contact forces, and with this I mean medial uh, knee contact force, lateral contact force, and total. I will now uh, start with the results. Uh, I just want to, uh, want to remind you that in case you have any question, you can already type uh, them in and I will answer uh, them at the end of the presentation. I will start now comparing the two most interesting groups, so subject with virus alignment and medial disease and subject with virus alignment and generalized disease. I can already tell you now that uh, they had these two groups have uh, very similar um, uh, malalignment, so there was no statistical, uh, statistical difference uh, between the groups. 
So what you can see here is the graph of the medial contact force during the stance phase of these two groups. In red, we have the virus and generalized disease patients, while in blue, we have the virus and medial disease patients. Immediately, you can notice how overall patients with only medial diseases seems to have a higher uh, medial contact force during the stance. Specifically, they seem to have a higher uh, peak, second peak of the force. But what is most interesting, I think, is what happened in the middle of the graph. Subject with generalized disease in red, you can see that they unload the medial compartment between the two peaks that are the load acceptance and the push-off peak. While instead, subject with virus and medial disease seems not able to unload the medial compartment and therefore maintain an higher contact force during most part of the stance. We will, uh, this seems also uh, interesting since evidence show that actually uh, continuous load is uh, uh, more detrimental to the cartilage compared to, than high peak, so an high load in a single time point. Let's now instead compare all the groups that we had in the study. To compare the groups, we use the impulse of the contact force and also the peak. As you can see immediately, the virus and medial disease group had an higher impulse and peak compared to all the other groups. The value that you see uh, reported in the table are already adjusted for the walking speed. So they already account difference in walking speed between the groups. And the statistical, uh, statistical analysis showed us that the impulse in the virus medial disease was uh, higher than all the other uh, groups, while instead the peak was only statistically significant uh, when compared to the virus and generalized disease. Therefore, already from here, it seems that the impulse of the force is a better measure to differentiate the groups. What is also interesting is to compare the subject with virus and generalized disease with controls or subject with neutrally alignment. We would expect subject with virus alignment to have an higher load. Instead, these subjects have basically a comparable load to the other groups, even to controls in the medial compartment. If we look what happens in the lateral compartment, uh, we can see that the virus medial uh, disease group have a lower lateral contact force inputs and lateral contact force peak. This time, however, the impulse was not statistically lower than all the other groups, while instead the peak was different only when compared to controls and neutrally aligned subjects. Finally, if we analyze uh, the total contact force, what we can see is that basically the total contact force, uh, both the impulse and the peak, is comparable between all the groups. This suggests that it's actually not the total contact force that changes between group, but rather the load distribution between the compartments. If you remember, our initial hypothesis was that this uh, division in subgroups was necessary because otherwise, if we would select patients based only on virus alignment, we would end up having a group with a load that is comparable to controls or subjects that are neutrally aligned and with osteoarthritis. Therefore, to confirm the starting hypothesis, we run a sensitivity analysis where we combine both the groups with virus alignment. What we obtain is that the medial contact force in this new uh, group was actually equal to controls or to osteoarthritis patients with neutral alignment confirming our initial hypothesis and confirming also the results obtained by Kumar. In the secondary analysis, we analyze the relationship between medial contact force and alignment. Here uh, are reported in red, the patient with virus malalignment and generalized disease, while in blue, we have the subject with medial disease. The relationship between alignment and medial contact force was significant only in the virus and medial disease. What, um, what you can see is that in the virus and medial disease, there are some subjects with a really severe uh, malalignment that are actually not present in the other group. Despite these, uh, that's not the reason uh, why the analysis was significant, but it's more what happens 
in the middle of the graph, so between four and eight degrees of malalignment, that is already a really significant uh, uh, deviation from normality. If you look at the subjects that have a severe malalignment, all the blue dots are actually located in the higher part of the graph, um, suggesting that all the subjects have an high, uh, high medial contact force, while most of the subjects in the uh, virus and generalized disease are in the lower part of the graph and therefore have a much lower uh, medial contact force. And this is the reason because uh, this linear model describes much better what happens in the virus and medial disease population where an increase in alignment determines an increase in medial contact force, while this doesn't happen in the other groups. The other secondary analysis, we compare MRI biomarkers. Specifically, we compare bone marrow lesions that are uh, bone bruises, uh, which are linked to uh, high load uh, in the joint. And we also compare meniscal maceration across the group. Meniscal maceration is a specific meniscal lesion that is also uh, caused by prolonged overloading. In this case, there is not a simple tear in the meniscus, but the meniscus is macerated. This means it is hardly distinguishable at MRI. So looking at the prevalence of bone marrow lesion in the medial compartment of both fibia and femur, we can see how the prevalence uh, in the virus medial disease was much higher than in all the other groups. Same results were obtained when we looked at the medial meniscus that had a prevalence of maceration much higher in the virus and medial disease group compared to the others. This suggests that the higher load that we saw in these uh, patients also corresponds to an higher prevalence of uh, damage. So if we now want to recap the main finding, we can see that uh, one of the most important would say that virus malalignment alone is not sufficient to identify subjects with increased media contact force, especially when it's associated with also a lateral compartment degeneration. This finding may explain why there are difference in treatment response to biomechanical intervention. So if actually we select just the patients using X-ray or using uh, only minimal alignment, it's possible that we include subjects with that do not have an increased medial contact force. Therefore, intervention that aim that aims to uh, reduce the medial contact force will not actually work on this patient. And this may be the reason for the contrasting evidence regarding clinical effectiveness of biomechanical interventions. As I said before, the impulse of the contact force seems to be a more sensitive measure uh, than the peak of the force to identify difference between the analyzed group. This therefore suggests that maybe in uh, future studies can be worth to actually look at the impulse of the force rather than at the single peak. This, uh, these results are also supported by a previous uh, study that suggests as well that the impulse of the force is actually the, be the, the best measure to uh, estimate the overall load uh, on the knee. Finally, the higher prevalence of bone marrow lesion and meniscal maceration in the medial compartment uh, support actually the link between increased load and knee damage. Despite this may be intuitive, we need to remember that this was a cross-sectional study. Therefore, the importance of this finding is because otherwise we could not link the medial contact force or the increased medial contact force with the disease. Therefore, these results tell us that it's possible that is the higher load that caused the disease. There are also some limitations that need to be addressed. The first is the MRI that is actually uh, the cost of uh, using MRI limit the clinical applicability of these uh, results or this of the study. 
Therefore, uh, we can either we work to identify other measures that have similar sensitivity to MRI to inc uh, incorporate them in clinical practice, so to identify better the disease pattern in the knee and identify subjects with increased medial contact force, or we need to progress in this way and obtain results strong enough that may uh, result in um, increased treatment effectiveness because we are able to select the right patient for the right treatment. In this case, maybe the cost of the MRI will be balanced by the benefit of the treatment. The second limitation uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, as I said before, that due to the cross-sectional design of the study, uh, we cannot actually say that the higher medial contact force caused the disease. However, the fact that we identify uh, MRI biomarkers of damage in patients with also higher medial contact force seem to suggest that this is the most likely explanation of the disease in this specific subgroup. Another limitation is that the contact forces uh, are actually estimated. As you know, it's not possible to measure in vivo in this patient contact forces, and therefore we need to rely on biomechanical uh, modeling. Fortunately, these models have progressed in the last year, and uh, when tested uh, against um, uh, implants, uh, this model gives really good estimation of the contact forces. Finally, the last limitation is the sample size. Despite we managed to include almost uh, 60 uh, subjects in order to transfer this work to clinical practice, uh, it's necessary a much bigger sample. If we want to recap, which are the most important clinical implications, is again that malalignment alone is not sufficient to identify subjects characterized by high media contact forces and that therefore a different approach needs to be taken when biomechanical interventions are tested on, on subjects with osteoarthritis. And this because if we are able to identify patients characterized by, in this case, higher internal uh, medial contact force, we may actually target them with specific treatment and we can in this way improve the treatment effectiveness. For uh, the ones that are uh, interested in the paper, the result of the study have been published on osteoarthritis and cartilage. And uh, you can, uh, if you follow the reference, uh, you can uh, see the open access version of this uh, study. With this, I conclude my presentation and uh, I will be more than happy to take any questions. All right. Thank you, Andrea for a great presentation. There we go. Before we go into the Q&A, I would like to remind you of our upcoming webcasts. There is one the 26th of April called Model Validation Using the Anatomical Visual 3D Workspace. Um, I would also like to remind you about our website where you can check out events, dates, publication lists, and so on. Our next event is the CMBBE, and then we also have the advanced PhD course at Albor University. And also, please follow us on social media. Search for Anybody Technology on both LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube to get if you want updates about what's going on here at Anybody Technology, such as news, previous webcast, features, models, and so on. All right, time for questions. If you're ready, Andrea, we'll just dive yes. right in. Uh, was there forced plate data collected during the motion capture? Uh, yes, uh, we collected also the, the force plate data and thanks also to that we were uh, able to estimate any contact forces. Great. The next one is, what's the lateral contact forces in the groups? Hmm. So uh, in the lateral, as I presented before, the lateral contact force uh, in the virus and medial disease was actually the lowest. So both the impulse and the peak were the lowest compared to all the other groups. 
and um, th th therefore it, this seems to respect the, the pattern. The subjects do not have difference in total contact forces, but they have a shift of the load, so from the lateral to the medial compartment. Okay, great. The the next one is about the walking speed. How exactly was walking speed considered in the contact force calculations? Uh, yes, we run a, an ANCOVA test. The ANCO analysis of covariance account for one external variable that in this case was walking speed. And so use the walking speed to balance the difference between the groups. So uh, it's accounted in the mm, statistical test. Thank you. Then we have a technical question here, maybe for Michael. Uh, it says, I wonder if you can provide technical details regarding incorporating knee alignment in your musculoskeletal model. For example, did you use the same knee joint model to simulate different groups? This is a very good question. So as Andrea explained, we use this uh, model from Lund and et al, um, which we use morphing. So we use basically the alignment that we get from the standing reference trial. And then we morph the musculoskeletal model to have the same alignment so that the musculoskeletal model is not just a simple linearly scaled model, but has the, the malalignment of the subjects. Otherwise, we could, wouldn't be able to capture these effects. Great. Thank you, Michael. Then uh, let's take a, a couple of more questions. Uh, thank you for the engagement here. The next one is, do you find any difference in kinematics between groups? And I think it continues, such as flexion, adduction, and internal external rotation angle during stance. That's a, a very good question, uh, a question. And actually, we are working on analyzing the kinematics of the subject. So this uh, paper, this work, focuses mainly on uh, knee contact forces. After that, we identified that there were differences between the groups. Now we want to understand uh, uh, in which way, if there is a difference in the way in which this patient walk, for example, one with generalized disease that lead to a reduction of the medial contact force. So we will look in the kinematics and this mean uh, moments and also the gait pattern of the subject to try to uh, better characterize these groups. Okay, cool. Let's take a couple of more. Um, so according to your results, it is recommended to use MRI examination in combination with clinical examination to confirm OA phenotype, right? Mm -hmm. Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> so let's say that uh, at the moment for uh, the limitation, as I said, uh, using MRI is really costly and so cannot actually be implemented in clinical practice. What uh, I can say is that in the moment in which someone wants to run a study to uh, test the effectiveness of the uh, of biomechanical interventions, maybe it's the case to actually look at what is happening in the lateral compartment. Uh, this means at least maybe using some major like fixed joint space width with the X-ray or anyway try to gather as many information as possible what's happening in the joint because the risk is otherwise to test on a population that does not have an increased media contact force so that we try to reduce uh, the media contact force in subjects that do not have an increase in, in that force okay the next one here is did you find any significant difference in kinematics between your subgroups particularly frontal plane kinematics? Mm. Uh, as I uh, said before, we didn't uh, actually analyze the, uh, the kinematics of these patients. We only looked at the uh, contact forces. Uh, therefore, I cannot actually comment on this, but uh, we are interested in looking also uh, uh, in this part, because actually we believe that it is important to explain why these patients are actually uh, have a different load pattern. Yeah, I see. Um, I'll give you, let's take one last question here. And that is, 
were the subjects tested with any orthosis such as braces or insoles, especially the group with higher medial uh, contact force? That's a very good question. And unfortunately, we couldn't test this uh, uh, subject with intervention to see if uh, the if the intervention would have a different uh, response of this uh, on this subject rather than uh, on the other. So this is actu actually something really interesting and that we we should look in uh, in future research. OK, um, thank you. That was it for the Q&A. And Thank you very much. Yeah, no worries. Um, Thank you for the presentation, Andrea, and thank you for answering the questions. And thanks to all of you who tuned in, and thanks for the engagement here in the Q&A. That was really nice. So have a nice day, and goodbye.